A true sandbox survival horror. Fight to survive against a zombie-packed post-apocalyptic world that gives you, the player, freedom to choose how to do so. Settle down inside a house, fortifying the entrances with advanced expansive crafting and fortification systems, grow crops in a fully fleshed out farming system, and even build electrical devices to keep the lights on and the power tools working. Outside the potential safety of your house is a dangerous place where zombies might be the least of your worries. The massive, beautiful terrain of Alberta, Canada, comes with a full weather system, day-night cycle, and of course other survivors that want what you have. Explore, fight, build, survive. This was the pitch for Dead Matter on their Kickstarter campaign back on July 17th, 2017. A dream game in a genre that has seen some of the most demand from gamers around the world since the breakout of DayZ mod back in May of 2012. DayZ managed to reach over a million players in just three months, eventually going on to become a standalone game that sold millions of copies around the globe. Dead Matter was described by many to be the ultimate delivery of what DayZ should have been, and yet, as of August 2022, has not delivered on that dream. So let's go back to where it all started, 10 years ago. So Johnny, tell us what your mod is about. Uh, Dead Matter is a open world zombie survival mod for Crisis 2. Uh, I had originally started working on it uh, in November 2011, and you know, now I'm kind of sitting right here. In March 2012, the user Johnny Guitar created a project on popular video game modding website moddb.com titled Dead Matter. He can be seen as early as March 7th 2012, replying to comments from those who found the entry and had excitement for the prospect of playing this game. This project was originally proposed as a mod for first person shooter Crisis 2. But Johnny Guitar made it very clear he and his small team were looking to create a standalone version of the game to turn the fan project into a real business. The goal was a Kickstarter, but they needed more people on the team and Johnny's idea for achieving this was to ask random users to private message him if they were interested in giving him money. At this point, a handful of screenshots and a music file were all that were on display, but there was a promise of a teaser trailer coming soon, with a playable download coming shortly after. On July 16th, the teaser released, and if you look back, it's, it's pretty comically bad. Despite this, the comments were mostly full of excitement. The next update came four months later with developer vlog number one, part one of two, which released on November 27th, 2012, in which Johnny Guitar shows some technical aspects of the mod like bullet drop, zombies, as well as houses and barricading. And in the second part of the vlog, 11 minutes of in-game footage, running around, shooting zombies, looting things, driving vehicles, and commentary from its creator. Just over a week later on December 9th, 2012, Reddit user Nikizor, which also happens to be Johnny Guitar, posted that the Dead Matter Closed Alpha was here. Users could finally get their hands on this Crisis 2 mod. Following this, they continued to develop the mod as well as working on an apparent standalone game, but it wasn't long until the drama started to kick in. An update that should have been available shortly after the closed alpha release was delayed until April of 2013, months later, due to a rogue staff member taking over the Dead Matter website and Facebook page. Following this, the mod was talked about less and less, and the focus was clearly on delivering a standalone experience which the developers will be able to monetize effectively. And then, nothing. They just stopped posting, they stopped talking about the mod, they stopped talking about the standalone, and everything just went dark. That is until, on March 30th, 2016, a post appeared titled, After All This Time, on the since-deleted website, deadmatter.rocks. Unfortunately, due to the fact that nobody archived these websites, all of the contents are completely missing. What remains are Reddit images and threads, usually with one or two comments, and often involving people discussing how they forgot they were even subscribed to the game's Reddit in the first place, and interest seemed to be at an all-time low. That is, until December 13th, 2016, where Dead Matter made it onto Steam, under the umbrella of the since-retired Greenlight program. Greenlight allowed for developers to get their game listed on Steam via popular vote. Within the first few days, Dead Matter had hundreds of comments and went on to become the fourth highest ranking game in the program's history. Needless to say, the interest for what they were trying to create was abundant. 
Just under eight months later, on July 17th, 2017, Dead Matter launched their Kickstarter campaign. The goal, as you'll often find on Kickstarter projects, was a laughably small amount, 60,000 Canadian dollars, which is around 50,000 US. Absolutely nothing in terms of making a game. But Dead Matter had been in development for five years already, allegedly. The developers, now known as Quantum Integrity, were no longer just a man making a mod, it was an actual studio that had been incorporated. Within the Kickstarter, they do discuss this number and stipulate that within these $50,000, they've budgeted to be able to pull off a successful early access game launch, which is where they will then gather the rest of funds required to finish the whole project. Of course, anything more is welcome and will mean additional features for the early access launch, but how it's worded is that if the Kickstarter succeeds, the game will make it to early access no matter what. Alongside this, they speak a handful of times about their transparent development process, the importance of showing everything to their fans as well as their vow, to never delete comments or silence the voices of their followers, an important promise that, while naive, does come into play a little bit later. Over the next 30 days until August 17th of 2017, the campaign went on to raise $285,784 Canadian, which is around 220,000 US. To raise this amount, the QI team presented what is referred to as stretch goals, in which they promise additional content or features for each milestone of funding reached. These stretch goals had planes and trains, including all infrastructure required to use them, a brand new map modelled after Vancouver Island, along with new enemies, weapons, clothes, vehicles, and places to explore, new interactive AI settlements and factions, radio and radio stations, modular gear, new weapons, enhanced Twitch support, and player-made structures. All of these goals are massive undertakings, especially for a small indie team who'd already committed to building a sincerely ambitious game using what is a team lead's annual salary to be divvied up amongst their entire company, minus taxes of course. Anyone familiar with this video series, video game development, or running a business will know that this would be impossible. However, it didn't stop people from believing in the dream, which I always say is much more important than the reality, especially when it comes to things people really want. 5,452 backers threw down their money in support, some of which were so convinced that they parted with thousands of dollars for packages that promised them things like 50 copies of the game, a producer credit, and an invitation to their launch party in Calgary, Alberta. Following the Kickstarter's massive success, QI immediately began selling packages on their own website store, giving latecomers the opportunity to buy in and support development of the definitive zombie survival experience, as well as launching an Indiegogo campaign on the 6th of February 2018, with a goal of $46,000, which went on to raise roughly $1.5 million in the next 30 days. At this point in the story, they've raised all the money they said that they needed, and I could run you through each development blog, which showed an impressively made game and many features people have been yearning for in this genre ever since the initial craze of Daisy mod. However, the most important and interesting parts of the story come from behind the scenes, as well as how the company acted towards fans that supported their shared vision. Dead Matter as a project has been plagued with delays since the very inception, all the way back in 2012 with the Crisis 2 mod. There have always been problems. Back then, it was a couple of friends with a shared love of what they were trying to create and there was no money involved, which makes it much more acceptable to just get things done when you can and not be held to deadlines. When you become a business, ask for $80,000 and raise close to $2 million plus whatever they raised privately on their website, this becomes an issue. You're now a business making promises. You now have to worry about the perception of your game, the perception of the management and what's going on with your community as you are beholden to them. Each problem, each delay, each change brings with it disappointment, especially when no one has been able to even play what they expected to get in their hands years previously. The QI team seemed to talk a great game at this time. They showed juicy content in their frequent blogs, but seemed incapable of launching the product in a timely manner, even in an early access or closed alpha state. This led to people being rightly unhappy, and when they shared this opinion, you can guess exactly what happened. Censoring dissenting opinions, something the Kickstarter campaign vowed not to do, turning the Discord into a fairly unpleasant place, which was heavily moderated, with even slight criticism or questioning of information being met with incredibly unprofessional behaviour and often bans. Running a community like a dictatorship and then responding to criticism by hiding behind a bot 
to send sarcastic and petty remarks while simultaneously denouncing those same practices from your community members and then demanding their respect is a very bad look. Not only is it distasteful, but it's extremely unprofessional. It has been a continued problem in the dead matter community that you aren't allowed to question things or even engage in civil discourse if it does not fit the agenda of these mods and community reps and even partners. The delays were not the only thing that were an issue. There was a lot of mixed messaging regarding the expectations of the constantly impending closed alpha. How would it happen? What would be the details? Many people familiar with alphas were bringing up the topic of an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement, a contract signed by users to prevent them from discussing or showing materials covered under said contract under penalty of punishment, which would include a game ban, as well as potential civil lawsuits should the offender do any significant damage to the studio or their product. Multiple sources, including the CEO of the company, had answered this question frequently. The game would not be under NDA, they would continue to be transparent as they promised in their initial Kickstarter in Indiegogo. This changed as of roughly May 26th, 2019, when the question came up again, and this time confirmed that an NDA would in fact exist for all closed alpha testers. And a couple of months ago, we have been told that no, there wouldn't be any type of NDA, but now it seems like they have switched their mind. Now they are gonna be implementing this in the closed alpha. I haven't seen any reasoning why they have done this, but what I can see is that it is gonna be used to prevent any type of negativity to go out in the public. We do know that this is indeed a closed alpha, meaning it's gonna be first launched to the backers and we are gonna be experiencing a lot of bugs and glitches. Of course, at this stage, most of the promises made in the initial Kickstarter campaign were completely broken. Banning users who had criticism for the team when they said they never would, locking the game state behind a legally binding contract, not delivering the product even in a diminished state by any of the estimated dates, and backers would soon be finding out that many of the promised features were nowhere near ready, flat out didn't work, or were scrapped altogether. A lot of the things that they were showing in the blogs simply wasn't in the game. So after years of delays, the alpha release was finally going to happen. On July 27th, 2020, a Reddit post detailed how to claim your alpha key from the QI software website, and anyone who backed it an appropriate level in the three years of prior crowdfunding would be able to do so. This, as with almost everything regarding Dead Matter, did not go as planned. There were thousands of users who had backed the game who could simply not see their purchase when registering on the website, therefore they couldn't redeem a key. That was if you were lucky enough to get the website to load, which the Dead Matter Twitter account acknowledged with their advice, stop pressing F5, referring to people refreshing the site over and over again in their attempt to gain access, but instead overloading the service with traffic. These problems, while frustrating, are expected when a game with tens of thousands of hyped fans are about to finally get their hands on something they've been dreaming about for, in some cases, eight years. With a little bit of communication from the devs and over a couple of days, these issues would resolve themselves. Instead of communicating, however, the developers claimed they were getting too much toxicity and locked down the Discord server. They also claimed the website was being DDoSed, which stands for Distributed Denial of Service, a malicious attack that aims to take a service offline by sending constant bombardments of traffic to that source. And while this could be true, Realistically, this distraction was not the biggest issue. These problems were actually a blessing in disguise, just nobody in the public knew it as of yet. When the Discord server was opened again, there were constant updates from the team stating they would keep working to get keys sent out to backers. Behind the scenes, however, there was a key shortage. And I'm not talking about a few hundred of them missing, I mean tens of thousands. This was a massive issue, a massive issue that they knew about but didn't delay the launch because that would have been seen as yet another delay, it was easier to just blame it on other factors. According to posts in the announcement section of the Dead Matter official Discord, this key problem persisted for about 5 days. Essentially what happened is that when Dead Matter was launching their closed alpha on the Steam platform, to do so they would need to request keys from Valve, the company who owns and operates Steam. Valve, for whatever reason, were holding these keys back from QI, which means there were none to give to the public who would back the game and required those keys to download and play. Now, there's a lot of speculation as to why exactly this happened, so to clear this up, I had conversations with multiple current or former employees of QI, which asked, of course, to remain nameless. Each person interviewed told the same story regarding their lack of preparedness for this launch. Despite it being known about internally for a real long time and coming at the end of a seven-day public countdown, the keys they were due to give to backers 
were simply not requested until a couple days before the scheduled release, which means when Valve said no, there wasn't any leeway for them to solve the matter without doing a delay. According to these sources, they went ahead with the launch knowing full well they didn't have any keys to give people. The CEO, Nick Zorko, or Johnny Guitar as he's known from the start of the story, eventually convinced Valve to give them the keys, but it was in small batches. The reason Valve initially declined is the sheer volume of keys requested in such a short period of time. This illustrates a lack of foresight, planning, and competence directly from management, leaving the most integral part of the launch until the very last minute without any contingency plan really has no excuse at all. They were incredibly lucky that Valve worked with them to resolve it in a handful of days, or this could have been an even bigger blunder that was entirely avoidable given they had months to prepare the keys for distribution. To reiterate, they only requested the keys 24 to 48 hours prior to launch, were told no, and then decided to go through with the launch anyway. This situation brought about a massive issue for QI, the dead matter community, and the potential growth of the business. As part of the arrangement between Nick Zorko, the CEO, and Valve to get these tens of thousands of keys delivered for the closed alpha, Valve also stipulated that keys for the closed alpha could no longer be sold for dead matter on any platform until it was ready to be sold on Steam. The reason for this should be quite clear. Steam takes 30% cut on all sales and QI was selling tens of thousands of keys on their website while expecting Valve to generate those keys, have the game deployed on Steam and get nothing at all in return. These messages updating the community, as with many messages in the official Dead Matter announcement server, comes from a user with a white name. Anyone familiar with Discord will know, this means the user in question is no longer in the server, meaning they no longer work with QI in any capacity, oftentimes actually being banned from the server due to quote, misinformation. So after the issues with the keys had been resolved and people got into the game, it was clear that development had not been going to plan thus far. Despite the non-disclosure agreement, people were keen to share their opinions online, even if it risked them a ban. It was rare to see a particularly good word spoken about the state of the closed alpha experience, unless the good word included a hope for the future of the game. Maybe it will get there one day. What they had so far was many, many years away from even mirroring what the DayZ mod had delivered from a single developer eight years prior from the standpoint of a fun game to play. The only footage that can be found online of Dead Matter is sourced officially from QI themselves or special partnered content creators who were given permission to stream and post videos for specific periods of time during the test, and the comments under each of these videos mirror the sentiment of those who could not speak out publicly. The game was not worth the wait, and at this rate, may never be. Now to address non-disclosure agreements, I can't say that they're not useful in certain limited situations. What I can say is that in gaming, they're often used in a way that hurts you way more than helps you. The closed alpha had reportedly over 60,000 users, and there is no way you will ever contain all of those opinions or prevent people from leaking footage. Having the NDA, however, shows that you are trying to hide something. When you claim transparency and then your actions betray you, people will notice, and at that point, you might as well have taken the negative publicity for an alpha game having alpha game problems, as opposed to an alpha game having alpha game problems, as well as claims of silencing people's opinions for a product that wouldn't even exist without their patronage. Moving beyond this, the game has been in development for two years since then, and not a whole lot has changed. There are also a lot of conspiracy theories in the Dead Matter community regarding where the money went and how it may have been misplaced. For example, some people are convinced that Nick Zorko, the CEO, bought himself a mansion, which I did my usual checks for, which include mortgage and land parcel ownership searches, speaking to current and former employees, and other means, which turned up absolutely nothing. Dead Matter's problems have nothing to do with someone being malicious or misplacing the funds. The issue is, has, and always will be, complete and utter incompetence of management. The studio has faced such a high turnover in staff, as well as such a huge shift in game design and reworking old game design, rewriting old code, that is nowhere near launched despite being in development for over five years since the original Kickstarter. The public facing message from QI seems to be that they are heading towards an early access release on Steam, which has been subjected 
to almost as many delays as the original closed alpha test was, and now is coming sometime in 2023. This brings with it the ability for them to start making money again, selling access to the game, and an end to the non-disclosure agreement, which lets people show the state of Dead Matter without risking a lawsuit or having some kind of special permission. QI took on new studio management in September of 2021, who made sweeping changes to the way things were being handled, including closing all of development during January of 2022, using that time to restructure workflows and organize the studio in a more modern manner. The letter penned by this new studio head reads as if things had been run by cowboys for the previous four years, and he had to step in and add some order to the chaos. During this letter, Derek recognized the number one problem with development thus far had been a lack of clear direction, which is definitely not something you want to be hearing from somebody four years into development. On top of this, he touched upon the fact that many employees had changed over the years. What he didn't mention is that the actual number one problem with the studio was management, management he was now part of, and he was about to be the cause of multiple other employees leaving the studio as well. According to these people I interviewed, the management of QI has always been troublesome. Nick spent too much time and money where it wasn't required, such as hiring office space for a mostly international and remote team, constant rewrites of code that didn't need to be rewritten, removing of code, art or features that were made by team members who left the project, which was a frequent occurrence, hiring of and promoting of people who were not fit for the position, and much, much more. While this was supposed to be Nick's vision, he would often disappear from meetings, stop replying to urgent messages regarding issues or direction for the game, and instead work on programming or reprogramming systems that were not a priority or wouldn't even make it into the game, while also constantly making public promises of release dates that were never even discussed with the team, leaving them to find out only when they browsed the public Discord server and knew that the date was impossible to meet based on the current state of the game internally. When they tried to bring this up with Nick, he was often dismissive, sometimes abusive and angry. Multiple employees told me it was commonplace for Nick to scream at people during meetings, especially if they were critical of something relating to the game or his actions. That is, of course, if he was in meetings at all. This means management was left up to whoever was his right hand at the time. The two that were talked about had different issues. One of them was prior to the restructuring we just went over that happened in late 2021, and this manager was known as Metamoth. He was simply too inexperienced for the job, which was not just studio manager, but also that of the lead level designer. The level design that, of course, when he left, was part of a complete recreation yet again, because it was so bad. The situation as it was described to me was that experienced team members who knew what they were doing and worked on a lot of games were constantly being mismanaged by Nick and Metamoth, making them perform tasks in ways that didn't make sense, that the team knew would be a waste of resources, but knew better than to push back as they had seen people be mocked, laughed at, and fired for doing so previously. On top of this, due to Nick's propensity for making promises to the fans about release dates without consulting anybody within the team, the employees were under constant crunch, so much so that management would literally track their Steam profiles to criticise them if they'd been playing too many games in their spare time and not coming into work instead. Commenting on their relationship status and how they needed to focus more on work, trying to manipulate them to stay for longer hours with remarks like, you were like a brother or sister to me, if they were to be found leaving while others were still crunching, or receiving work texts at 4am, calls late into the evening, and much, much more. On top of this, despite the terms being agreed upon during interviews before they were joining the team, it wasn't uncommon for people to be waiting weeks or months for their pay. And if all that wasn't bad enough, then I'll read you a quote from one of my interviews. After leaving QI, my co-workers and I found some interesting portions of the, at the time, recent blogs that related to us or others, essentially blaming the game's issues on past members. These blogs were all written by the studio manager at the time. I'd like to also mention that all the issues mentioned in these blogs were never brought up with me or the rest of the team, because like I said before, the studio manager never gave feedback or took steps to fix the issues, and Nick seemed to be completely unaware of them. When we did bring up these blogs to Nick, he was furious in our DMs, saying this was, quote, unacceptable, I can't believe this happened, this is disgusting behaviour, etc. Unfortunately, nothing ever happened to the studio manager other than a slap on the wrist and a lame, forced apology. 
As a result of this, most of the experienced team who could have made the game left for greener pastures, which is a self-fulfilling prophecy of digging the game into a deeper hole, as with each person leaving, Nick or the studio head would decide that their work needed to be changed or removed entirely, wasting more and more resources. After this, in late 2021, they replaced the studio manager with Derek, whom was an entirely different manager. Many employees had hope that with this new hire, the tide would shift in favour of a more professional work environment that would be competently handled for once. And they were wrong. Inexperienced, passive-aggressive, rude, and a yes-man for Nick is how the new studio head is described by many. When speaking to the unnamed sources, I asked each of them if the game was a scam. They all said no, but it would likely have been a better result if it had been one. The money has been spent on good faith creation of dead matter, just in a way that is so terribly misguided that most of it has been wasted. I also asked if they believe the game will ever fully release. This was when each of them told me a different worded version of no. They all believe that money is getting tighter, which is why Nick was constantly stressed about paying out employees what they were owed. His lack of ambition in replacing the senior staff that himself and management alienated, causing them to leave the company, as well as constantly trying to rush this early access release for a game that he knows is years away from being ready for public consumption. The recent push for the early access Steam launch likely comes out of necessity and not because the game is ready. If the game launches into early access, the shroud of a non-disclosure agreement will do them no further good and the negative reviews will tank the game's reputation more than it already has been, while not bringing in any sufficient sum of money to turn the tide, as money has never been the issue. In fact, Dead Matter had a budget infinitely bigger than anyone could have hoped for and orders of magnitude higher than what the original Kickstarter pitch claimed to need. What many people do not know is that Dead Matter and QI as a studio are living on borrowed time and have been for a while. The crowdfunding money ran out long, long ago. The majority of it was wasted in code, art, employees that have since come and gone. The question people should have been asking, how do you keep expanding your team while having no source of income? The answer, according to the people I interviewed, is that QI received heavy investment from none other than everyone's favorite mega corporation from China, Tencent. Now this is not out of the ordinary for gaming as Tencent have been doing their very best to gobble up as many Western development studios and games as they possibly can, big or small. For QI though, this investment came with strings attached and those strings have been cut by the incompetent management. The development of Dead Matter has seen no significant progress, the money Tencent handed over has been wasted and is mostly ran out. Tencent is angry and will hand over no further investment. Therefore, according to some sources, QI have fired most of their art team, is no longer actively hiring despite publicly appearing to do so, and pushing out this early access client despite knowing it is not ready for public consumption to just keep the lights on at the studio and continue to try to deliver on Dead Matter as they promised. The new studio manager Derek, who joined at the back end of 2021, left another company who he ran into the ground and was on the verge of bankruptcy to do so. Joining QI, he was supposed to be the literal saviour of the whole game in the development studio. He was even paid more money than the CEO, a number that people find ridiculous, considering he is now leaving the company just over a year later in a worse state than how he found it. This leaves management entirely up to Nick, the guy whose only experience in game dev comes from making Gary's mod servers and seems not to have learned much about managing a studio while having done so in the last four years. So many people requested this video, as Dead Matter has an incredibly high number of disgruntled backers and ex-employees. However, unlike in many of the other Kickstarter to court series, they seem to suffer from incompetence and not from malevolence. The only court that Dead Matter is going to, at least for now, is the court of public opinion. There doesn't seem to be any misappropriation of funds from my investigation. They are offering refunds to people who back the game and are unhappy with current development, and they're still actively trying to work on an eventual release. Although in my opinion, it's unlikely to materialize in any way that delivers on what people got excited about all those years ago. And if people were to ask for refunds in any sizable amount, it's very likely the studio would straight up fold as they have no income source, no investment source, and development is draining what little remains in the coffers. Some of the ex-employees told me that they were waiting for thousands of dollars, some of them tens of thousands of dollars worth of back pay that in some circumstances is still unpaid. 
So to recap what exactly went wrong, at the time of crowdfunding, the CEO Nicholas Soko was a 20 year old with no commercial game development experience, no shipped games, and he was just a hobbyist modder. This was the least of his problems, as the CEO doesn't need to be writing code, although if they got less funding he would have needed to be a more integral part, so that experience would have helped. The issue is, he has even less experience in running a multi-million dollar software studio with dozens of employees to manage, and picking the right people to put in the right management positions. The project started out with claims of transparency, and ended with a legally binding document to prevent transparency due to the knowledge the game was a mess and people shouldn't be talking about it. They started out with a promise to never ban or silence the fans who gave them money to pursue the dream, and ended with a community where users are scared to share their criticism for fear of reprisals. They started out with delivery estimates that have been missed by years, with many more years to go before the deliverables are met for even the initial vision back in 2017. They started out independent and ended up suckling from the money tap of Tencent and still couldn't leverage that into a competently run studio or any kind of minimum viable product to maintain funding. Overall, they failed to create what they sold to people, at least for now. And we can assume from the constant delays in the illuminating employee testimony that the CEO didn't handle the job well, which means ill intention is not required for money to have been wasted. If the CEO ran away with the money or bought a house, that's of course fraud. He didn't do that. But he did waste people's money on incompetent management, and the result is very nearly the same. Whichever way you look at it, whether it was by malevolence or incompetence, all the money's gone, and there's a very slim chance that people get the game they paid for. The game is almost unrecognisable in terms of scope compared to their initial vision, with the map being stripped down in both quality and size for the upcoming Early Access Rush launch, and according to every source I interviewed, not even one of them had any hope that this game would be finished one day. All these things and more have given people reason to lose all faith in the studio, and therefore the game that they were supposed to deliver. I can't personally blame the CEO, because all he did was have a dream to deliver a game, and then people were naive enough to give him the money to try, without looking into his personal experience, or understanding just how hard it is to make a good product. Realistically, the biggest studios in the world, with the most experience you can possibly have, with funding beyond your wildest imagination, can make bad games, can make failures, so expecting a massive ambitious game to come out of a studio without any of these things is unreasonable to begin with. That would make you the exception, not the rule, and something you shouldn't really be betting on happening. It is not a crime to think you can do something and then fail, even if I personally believe you should not try to fulfil your dreams by standing on the shoulders, or more aptly the stacks of cash, from those who lack the information to make the decision to let you do so.